download some drivers for it next time. I mean, normally it would say it doesn't recognize it, right? It, there's no drivers available or something. Yeah. So it seems kind of odd. But um, I'll just uh, I'll just log in here real quick. And sure. I'm gonna sit at the front of the class so I can speak. Yeah, please. Okay. Right. So you'll go over to the site, right? Okay. Okay. So. Um, Folks, last time we had talked about um, the use of uh, a hybrid modeling technique involving uh, decision analysis and system dynamics modeling, although it applies more broadly to uh, simulation modeling of general sorts, dynamic modeling, whether it's in agent-based modeling or system dynamics. There was a specific tool uh, built by a member of this class that actually works with uh, Benson. Within today's class and the next one or two classes, we're going to be talking about trade-offs between the sorts of modeling we've seen, sort of reflecting on the sorts of modeling we've seen thus far. And uh, we're going to further be talking about hybrid strategies um, of a broader sort. So we saw this the hybrid between um, what's uh, typically not considered a dynamic modeling strategy, uh, a strategy that uses decision trees on the one hand, and dynamic models. We're going to be looking at hybrids between these different types of dynamic modeling. So we'll look at models that build together stocks and flows with agents, that build together discrete <coughs> event simulation with agents. And uh, we may even look at something that, that involves all three. Um, today, I wanted to specifically talk some about trade-offs. There's no question that while we can create hybrid models that build together um, different components of a, of, a, of a single model with each different component coming from uh, different using a different sort of modeling, it's important when we do that to have some sense as to some of the trade-offs that apply. Why would you choose a component made um, using one sort of modeling or using a different sort of modeling? It's important to have a sense of their, their natural strengths and natural limitations um, so that you can more artfully combine them. Combine them within a given model and combine them within a modeling project that might involve a suite of models that work together to, to lend insight. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. So um, uh, I appreciate the, the prompt there. I'm going to go and start uh, desktop sharing here. And, oops, uh, share desktop. Okay, okay so um, within today's, work, uh, today's lecture, we're going to be talking about some of the trade-offs and limitations between agent-based and aggregate modeling. I'd like this to be a, um, a more interactive session with the class and would encourage all of you to speak up, ask questions, because there's going to be a lot of material here that are based on my many years of experience working with both sorts of modeling. Some of it will no doubt be cryptic at times. Some of it will be um, something you might want to challenge. So I'd welcome uh, you know, discussion about any of the points we're going to be discussing today. Um, we will be looking at this question of trade-offs from a variety of angles. We'll be looking at it from the angle of um, uh, sort of the its impact on policy questions we can ask, on accuracy of the simulation, on um, uh, ability of the simulation to be used by a wide, to be built by a wide variety of types of modelers and a variety of other criteria, includes, uh, including sort of limitations and the insights you can get from a model. So um, I should note within this presentation, broadly speaking, I've concentrated on sort of two important sorts of differences. One that are more um, inherent or fundamental about the sorts <coughs> of modeling. The others that are more based on the current current state of the art when it comes to um, software support for these sorts of modeling. What, what do tools out there support? What do they happen to support well? What do they happen to support in a limited way? 
which is important from a pragmatic perspective, although in the long term, I'm, no, I'm, I'm sure that it will be evolving quickly. So I'm going to be concentrating first on this inherent side, um, uh, talk about some of, the, um, some of the issues. So just as a sort of overall uh, reminder here, we're talking about two, two separate sorts of modeling. Our focus is, is broadly uh, within the health area here. So uh, firstly, sort of aggregate models, uh, where we're characterizing them uh, using differential equations. Population is divided into two or more state variables, or stocks, according to attribute. Think S, I, and R, for example. Um, and in this case, typically the number of state variables and the number of parameters is much, much less than the population size. So if we were to count the number of people in the population being simulated, the state of the simulation, the, the amount of information that need, would need to be captured to sort of save away and then later restart the simulation is, is much, much smaller than the population. It might be three numbers, S, I, and R, for the number of people in each of those categories, in the sort of most pure example for a um, classic SIR model. Um, even if we're going and we're breaking the population, say, down by sex or by, gen or by uh, ethnicity or by age, Typically, the number of state variables will be much less than the size of the population. Okay. More recently, um, we've looked at, uh, there's been an advent of, of individual-based models, and that's the type of model we've spent most of our time in the course thus far, whether it's at a discrete event uh, formulation or in an agent-based formulation. And here, there's less of a strong established tradition about how to describe individual behavior. Um, while stocks and flows, in other words, differential equations are really the classic mechanism for aggregates, aggregate models with variations like delay differential equations, etc. For individual based models, there's more variability in how you describe things. <coughs> but each individual here is evolving. And here, the number of state variables and parameters is basically proportional to the size of the population. We have sort of a similar amount of state to save away, similar to the population size. So these are quite, quite different sort of granularities of specification of the population. We have here on the left an aggregate model with four stocks, and on the right a model where individuals are depicted in nodes and connected up in, in networks. So from my perspective, the selection of granularity is a, is, a, is a function of the question that we're asking, not of the true nature of the system. Um, it's true certain, certain aspects of a system might lend us towards one approach or another. For example, if we're, if we're modeling water, water resources, there's not a lot of compelling reason to capture things at an at a individual based level with individual water molecules or what have you. Um, it makes sense to capture at an aggregate level. But if we're dealing with uh, human populations or populations of, of, of animals, um, we, we're often going to be finding our research question, um, what we're seeking to achieve as, as really shaping what, how we build our models. And I'd like to distinguish here, in a very important way, between two different uses of models you'll see well represented in the literature. The first of them focuses on modeling for qualitative insight. This is a, a type of modeling where we're trying to get some insight that might explain certain types of behavior we're seeing in the external world. And we're really using the model as kind of a broad thinking tool. We're not interested in the model replicating in a very close way some particular external circumstance so much as to help us think through what dynamics would be expected under certain types of circumstances. What broad features of a situation that we know are going on in the world um, might introduce new dynamics and what, what sort of dynamics might they be? What might on a broad level really accelerate the diffusion of computer viruses into a corporation, for example, or, or what, what things might really um, cause uh, a big gain in terms of lowering the burden of, of uh, diarrheal diseases following a natural disaster. 
um, what sort of things might make a big difference versus a, a smaller difference, how soon might they make a difference. These are sort of rough, um, rough questions that we're interested in articulating without a model claiming to be a depiction of a particular circumstance with great uh, detail. The other use of modeling you'll see is modeling to quantitatively predict. And the prediction that's being made here might be a forecasting of what's likely to happen going forward. More likely it's to be a, a comparison between outcomes of interventions. So if we do this, if we do that, what sort of gains should we expect to see in quantitative terms? Is this policy 10% better than this other policy? Um, and uh, when will they cross? We're, we're hoping to get very detailed uh, understanding of the trade-offs, perhaps cost-effectiveness analyses, for example. And here we're looking for a detailed characterization of the situation. If we aspire to quantitatively understanding those trade-offs in great detail, we better have backed this model up with quite a bit of detail about the external situation. So, in the first case, we're looking at models that are, in the word of uh, my colleague Carl Simon from, from uh, University of Michigan, caricatures. They're models that sort of roughly capture the essential features of the external situation in enough ways that we can kind of use them as thinking tools to explore, explore trade-offs at a qualitative level. In the latter case, we're really looking for a rich, robust model. Within your projects for this course, I've included, I've suggested that many of you focus at least initially and for, for many throughout the entire project on this first element. And it's very important to reflect on this because people get caught up, particularly in the agent-based modeling world, they get caught up with the assumption that you're trying to quantitatively predict things, that you're trying to understand um, and, and very precise ways trade-offs between interventions so the exact um, amount of, of, of uh, health burden reduction to expect. Whereas really models can be very helpful with uh, only a modest amount of data for the first of these. I should note the system dynamics community, the community building stock and flow models has traditionally emphasized more the first of these. They've emphasized more this sort of modeling for qualitative insight. And that is reflected in the simpler nature of many of the models used, the fact that we have fewer stocks. I should note also that those simpler models are not only made sort of allowed according to the first of these, they're actually valuable because often the learning you'll get out of a very, very simple model is more direct in the sense that you'll you'll be able to understand more readily what's going on in that model compared to if it has lots and lots of moving parts. So if you're modeling for learning, it lends itself to very simple models, rough, rough, rough data, and qualitative insights. Um, if you want quantitative predictions, you're often dealing with quite complex, sophisticated models that are very fine-grained um, depiction of the external world. What you don't want to do is use the first type of model to try, to try to quantitatively predict. That can get you into real trouble. If you're building this first sort of model, you use it in its own, <coughs> for its own terms, in terms of qualitative insights. Don't use it as a vehicle for qualitative, for quantitative prediction. And uh, for those of you who go on to apply modeling after this course, you'll find that this is one of, your tension, uh, one of the tensions you'll face. Because if you build the source, first sort of model here, you'll find there's pressure to use it quantitatively, to try to use it to give very quantitative trade-offs. Because after all, the first sort of model, just like the second, gives numbers out. And someone who isn't familiar with modeling may think it's just as good as the second sort of model for quantitative insight. You have to know the limitations of the model, though. OK, the other issue here is that when I say granularity selection is problem-specific, you may have a situation where there's obvious, obvious features of the situation that you might model, for example, as agents. But you need, to, you need to question that impulse. First of all, you may want to capture some things within those agents. Don't assume that, for example, the person level or the animal level 
um, characterization of behavior at that level is necessarily the lowest level at which you'll focus. You may want to have rich dynamics within the context of an individual in some cases. In other cases, you may benefit from a, um, from a higher level representation. And again, the key thing here is that often you gain great insight from very simple models. Gas laws, for an example, are, are a very compelling example um, where you can get a lot of insights from rough high level models rather than trying to model uh, a gas at an individual molecular level, as is the, the focus of, of lattice gas models, for example. So we have to be careful in an agent-based context of, of thinking we're modeling the world from the bottom up because we're modeling uh, you know, from the person level on up. Um, you, you, need to, you need to challenge your notion of the scope of the model. A single person is indeed a natural locus of description. It's kind of a natural focus. A person presents for cares, lives or dies, has you know, coupled internal systems, but the world doesn't have a bottom here. And, and um, you often will want to be thinking about what is the scope of our person level model in a very active way. Don't assume that you know, um, there's not many processes operating below that level. Sometimes there are. So I'd like to talk here about contrasting benefits. So I'm going to cut to the chase here and talk about benefits, and then we'll go into some of them in more detail. So as far as I see it, um, there's some, some real trade-offs between individual-based models and aggregate models. Um, some real situations where each confers benefits. And let's, let's talk about those. Um, let's talk first about aggregate models, aggregate stock and flow models. Frequently, these sort of models allow for, number one, easier construction. In a process we'll talk about within another probably week or two's time, they allow for calibration that's easier, matching up a lot against a lot of historic data. Because there's fewer, fewer parameters that need to be adjusted often. And they allow for somewhat easier parameterization. Most importantly, arguably, they, are, they allow for formal analysis. So we can analyze an aggregate model at a mathematical level in a very rich way. This is not something I've, I've focused on within this course, but it's a very powerful feature of stock and flow models and differential mo equation models uh, in general. We can, we can actually uh, leverage a whole battery of techniques from um, applied mathematics to analyze these models. We can, we can identify their equilibria, the points where they're in this sort of balance. We can identify the stability of those equilibria. We can use techniques such as control theory to try to optimally select a policy that varies based on the observed external circumstances within the model. For example, that selects the best policy for treatment based on the stage of the epidemic. That, that adjusts vaccination based on observations of how many people are getting sick in the first few weeks of the vaccination rollout, et cetera. And often for aggregate models, there's easier understanding. This is, uh, this is a, a, a function both because the model has fewer parts in it, and therefore there's fewer things to look at. But number two, it's because the model allows you to run it very quickly. And so you can end up exploring a lot of scenarios very quickly interactively. And that can lend itself to sort of an understanding, a gut feel for why it's behaving the way it is. In terms of performance, um, uh, aggregate models have, have vastly lower cost often to run them. They're far, far quicker. And no matter how big the population is, the model's runtime is basically the same. W population multiplied by 10, multiplied by 100 or 1,000, it doesn't care. It's just numbers, a count of S, a count of I, a count of R for an SIR model. Just a number. Just another number. And it can compute with large numbers as quick as with small numbers. Um, there's less pronounced stochastics here um, at an aggregate level. So often we're less inclined to have to run a Monte Carlo ensemble. 
uh, it's something again we'll be getting to, but running the model again and again and again with different um, random random number sequences. And there's often qu quicker construction and runtime, so there's more time for understanding and refining the model, <coughs> for pushing its boundaries in some ways. By contrast, for individual based models, let's talk about some of their trade offs. So first of all, we can build individual based models that often offer much higher fidelity to certain sorts of situations. We can more readily represent, for example, um, exact aging times within an individual based model. Progression of cohort in terms of aging, very precisely. Whereas if we have an aging chain made up of first order delays and aggregate models, things tend to get smeared out. We can, represent, we can represent history dependent characters of individual dynamics in an individual based model in a way we can't with an aggregate model. We can ha make a person's trajectory within an individual based model depend upon their birth weight, whereas all we can do with an aggregate model is kind of classify into broad categories of birth weight, unless we want the model size to explode. Individual based models do allow for stronger support for highly targeted policy planning. Let's make this interactive. Why do I say individual based models will better support highly targeted policy planning? So policies which are, which are very, very specific to individuals. How would that be enabled by an individual based model? Can anyone say? Special delivery. Thank you very much. Um, so how, how would this be enabled by an individual based model? Why would I say you could, you could have more highly targeted policy planning? You could apply certain treatments to highly prone individuals or highly act, sexually active individuals. You can see what that does with the population. Okay, and this reflects the fact that often within an individual based model, we can represent a tremendous amount of heterogeneity characteristics of individuals that might be glommed together within an aggregate model, all just put into the S stock or the I stock. There's characteristics. Maybe it's their age, maybe it's their sex, maybe it's their ethnicity, but maybe it's things like their history of past infections. Or maybe it's their, the particulars of where they live within a landscape. Or their connection networks to other people. We can represent aspects of context much more richly. How's the audio, by the way? Very bad. Oh, very bad, eh? Very bad. Huh. Um, this one? Okay, do you want me to unplug it? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, it is unplugged. It is not actually Windows 7 compatible. Oh. That's okay. why it didn't come up. Oh, okay. Well, that's, that's uh, good to know. Let's um, try that one. Okay. Uh, wow. Ain't this service. Um, okay. And uh, do I just... Okay. Anyway, so it's on. And if you... Shall I make an utterance? <coughs> well, actually, if you... I've actually turned off your microphone. I'm going to get you to flip back to collaborate briefly. Okay. And just uh, <laughs> go into uh, tools. Tools, audio, audio yeah. microphone settings. Yep. Okay. And it's still not. Should I do refresh? Ah, there we go. Chat 50? Yep, that one. Okay. Um, okay. And uh, is that any better? Let me actually go back to all your privileges. Now, if you hit talk, I oh, okay. Hello, okay. No, much better. Okay, um, good, good, okay. So, we'll we'll try that for a bit. I don't know if that affected your uh, cam studio <laughs> session, but. Did you actually start it going? I, I did start it going, yes. So um, and that's never had a problem in the past, so we'll just... We'll just go with that. We'll just go with that. Okay, thanks. Um, 
Okay, so, uh, so the point here is that within an individual based model, we can capture heterogeneity aspects of context, like their position in a network, their position in space, their history, their um, demographic characteristics um, at, a, at a very, very rich level with quite modest cost. Doing that within an aggregate model is problematic for reasons we'll come back to. But essentially the size of the model and um, the ease of working with it um, head in very adverse directions if you try to represent this, this heterogeneity. The size blows up and it becomes very cumbersome to work with if you try to represent lots and lots of, of heterogeneity. Another individual based model uh, benefit is we can, cal we can calibrate to and validate longitudinal data. By longitudinal data here, I mean data concerning an individual's history or biography, as it's sometimes said, their experience over time. Often at, within health data, sometimes in veterinary data and other sources, we have information about a particular person over time. And in as much as we want our model to capture rich aspects of, of human behavior, it makes sense that we should invest in models that capture this behavior over time of an individual. But when an, what an aggregate model gives you, and this is an important insight that, that is very rarely talked about. In fact, I think I'm the only person I've noticed talking about this, but it's a very important, important thing. An aggregate model gives you a depiction over time for sure, but it's a cross-sectional depiction over time. So in other words, it doesn't tell you what a particular individual has done over time so much as the breakdown of the population among the socks over time. So it will tell you how many people are an S, an I, and an R, but you don't know if the person who was an I you know, 10 days ago is now the person who is an R now. You don't have that opportunity for sort of following the individual within an aggregate, in, uh, an aggregate model. And the tools just aren't there to even give you statistics on it right now. Individual-based models do provide uh, greater flexibility for representing heterogeneity and finer grain consequences. We can look at things like transfer effects within the population, whether our policy favors one group at the expense of another, something that would be masked, that would be glossed over, that would be hidden within an aggregate model. And finally, uh, it turns out individual-based models just allow for a simpler description of some causal mechanisms. It's often easier conceptually to talk about the connections between individuals in terms of a network than it is to write down mixing matrices, which can have quite complex sort of um, uh, constraints on them to ensure that they're properly balanced. A final thing I guess I'll say here, which is very important, is that for each of these, something you've got to talk about is that different people will find different ones of these appealing. So often, for example, doctors that you're working with are used to dealing with people at an individual level, and so individual-based models appeal to them. They speak to them. They're clearer to them to see things at an individual-based level because they encounter people at that level. Demographers, some epidemiologists, are more comfortable at an aggregate level, breaking the population down into categories and counting individuals, because that's, that's the way in which they reason about the situation. And that's not to be ignored. If you have a team where you have to work with a set of people from different backgrounds, considering what's most natural to them is very important when you're trying to figure out what model to use for a particular type of question. So here's some, here's some broad considerations. Key needs motivating individual-based models. What, what would lead me to think that I might, maybe I should use an individual-based model? Well, if I need information, if I have information in agent history, like information on, on a person's behavior over time, and I want to somehow make sure my model matches that properly, that would be a pretty good reason for an individual-based modeling approach. That's, that sort of history information is very hard to capture within an aggregate model. 
you might capture one or two bits of it, disaggregate the population based on whether the individual was exposed to a certain environmental risk, for example. So we have a stock of SINR of people who were exposed previously to a certain risk and another stock of those who weren't. But if we want to capture history in a richer way than one break, dichotomous breakdown, really want to do individual-based model. If we want to capture a progression of agents along multiple pathways, such as comorbidities. So someone here, tell me what do I mean by comorbidity. Give an example of a comorbidity. Heart disease. Okay, heart disease and, for example, diabetes, diabetes classic one. Because diabetes actually through the presence of blood sugars, glycosylation occurs, it can cause damage to heart tissue and heart disease results. Another common one that comes along with diabetes is peripheral neuropathy. So your nerves in your feet often start to get damaged or retinopathy, so your eyes. Um, but there's others as well. A given, a given person might suffer from heart disease and lung cancer. If you want to capture an individual's progression along multiple diseases at once or multiple processes at once, it's not, it doesn't have to be just diseases, it could be processes. It's much cleaner to do this in an individual-based way. You could do it in an aggregate-based model. You could break down everyone in your population, not only with respect to their infection status with respect to influenza, but also their infection status with respect to you know, the common cold or with respect to MRSA. You could break people down in this way according to their, to their exposure and infection status, but it starts to blow up. You have to capture all possible combinations of categorizations. Person is susceptible to influenza, but they are infected with, you know, the common cold. Um, they are recovered from, from you know, uh, MRSA or what have you, or or they're they're latently infected with TB. You have to capture all possible combinations of them in an aggregate model. In an individual-based model, you can capture them more or less independently with different state charts. And a person's in one state for one state chart, one state for another state chart, that's fine. If we want to characterize learning by agents or memory by agents, the fact that agents remember things, they react differently the first time a pandemic comes through than the, uh, the second time a pandemic comes through than the first time, or they learn from their experience in some ways which hospital to go to because they encounter it as too crowded or what have you. Or if there's a strong history dependence, so they shape their behavior in strong ways based on their experiences, then an individual-based model makes sense. It's hard to represent, hard to capture those effects adequately in an aggregate model. Again, what we would do is we disaggregate by this. We break down in an aggregate model, break down the population by if they had this experience or not. But it's a very crude sort of way of capturing it. It doesn't allow for capturing much richness there. Whereas in an individual-based model, we could have learning curves. People could get better at doing things over time. A doctor, for example, in a hospital model might get faster and faster at doing operations because they've had many of them to do previously. Um, and so they might develop experience. You can have an uh, aggregate model where people develop experience, but it will be a broad stock and set of stocks and progression along these stocks that, that would start to get cumbersome if you're combining it with other characteristics. If you want to have lo represent localized perception among agents, how is the audio right now? It's actually very good. Excellent. Okay. Well, I'm Although they did want to know if you really sound like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what that means. It's a little, it's a little more metallic. It's a noise canceling microphone. So oh, I see. I see. Um, <laughs> it doesn't give you that warmth and timbre. Oh, I see. So, so um, I, I sound like an android or something? It's not quite that bad. And we can hear you guys now when you speak. If you speak up. Okay, and you too can sound metallic. Um, <laughs> So, uh, thank you. So, I'm going to check back in from my office. That sounds great. That sounds great.
Much a, that puppy and we'll talk about it. Much appreciated. I'm, I'm glad my YouTube videos won't have my metallic facade. Why not let him do it and see? I think it sounds just like you, but <laughs> Carmel says it sounds a little more like Okay. Okay. Um, now she's going to be embarrassed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's, that's okay. Um, uh, I don't mind being considered a cyborg, I guess. Um, okay, so uh, another another motivation, moving right along. Another motivation is if we want to characterize, thanks a bunch, Tyson, uh, localized perception among agents. So suppose we had a model where we want to simulate traffic flow through a city, for example. Um, we might want the agents flowing along a given street to model actually what they see. So if there's a curve ahead of them, they might slow down anticipating the curve. If there's brake lights they see ahead of them, even if there's a significant distance in place, they might slow down um, in anticipation of coming up on some traffic. Um, these things have effects. And if we want to characterize that sort of localized perception, the contextualized perception, this can be important. From a health perspective, you think about things that influence people's behavior. And studies have shown the things that influence people's behavior the most are often the behavior of nearby individuals, for example. Even if you have very, very good friends, if they're remote, they often seem, from the, the evidence seems to suggest, they, they influence you much, much less, even a very dear friend, a very close friend, than someone who's nearby. Um, even if that person may not be nearly as good a friend. So localized effects, localized perception, localized in your social network, localized in space, often can have a really big impact. And once again, that's easier to capture within an individual-based model because we can represent the networks. We can represent the spatial locations of individuals and have them impacted. We can do approximations to these in an aggregate model. There's models that keep track of the number of connections an individual has. Breaks the population down by that, for example. Or breaks the population down according to what square they're in in a square grid that are differential equation models. But they tend to be coarser, much coarser in their, in their um, depiction. Okay, if we want to intervene at points in, change behavior on, explain phenomena over or dynamics across networks, if we want to explain why we see certain patterns in networks that we observe in real life, representing networks is much easier in an individual-based model. If we want to seek distinct interventions for different heterogeneous categories, if we do want to design anti-tobacco interventions that are different for different ethnic groups. For example, in the States, where I worked in tobacco control using modeling, one of the big distinctions there is um, uh, different, different ethnic groups have quite different distinctive smoking. The way in which smoking is integrated with their social life is different. With a lot of Hispanics, it's more of an occasional social activity with just one or two cigarettes each weekend when they're with family. For, uh, for uh, African Americans, there's often use of menthol-based cigarettes, which ra raise real risks associated with uh, esophageal cancer, etc. Um, and so you might want to build intervention strategies that target different subgroups with certain characteristics differently. It might be based on their location, on their location in a network, it might be based on their attributes. And if we want to do that, and we want to keep track of those attributes, doing so in an individual-based model is much easier. Um, we may want to capture uh, uh, behavior at an individual uh, level that's quite rich. It's based on heuristic decision making which evolves over time. It's based on, again, learning effects. And, and often <coughs> describing that behavior at an individual level is easier than describing it at an aggregate level. We may want to seek flexibility in exploiting different heterogeneity dimensions. We may want to take a given model and try adding in heterogeneity <coughs> by you know, um, family diabetes history or by um, uh, past history of encounter with the healthcare system, see how the model behaves with that and decide whether to take it out or not. 
turns out that doing so within an aggregate model is painful. We have to disaggregate the entire model. Often that means systematically going through and updating stocks and fl flows and auxiliary variables across the entire model. It's a global change to add in a dimension of heterogeneity. For example, if we want to take a model, like an SIR model, and add sex, uh, sex distinction to it, so you have men and women, you have to go copy that entire model. So we have S, I, and R for men, S, I, and R for women. If we want to then add five ethnicity dimensions in, we have to then copy each of those five times. And so it becomes cumbersome. There are ways to lessen it through what's called subscripting, but it still becomes cumbersome with, with subscripting. Um, so, and, and more, more to the point, it, it affects the entire model. And so if you want to go back then and take that out, you decided that it wasn't worth it after all, it's a big operation. It involves intricate changes across the model. So a lot of work to just explore whether you want to add a bit of heterogeneity in. Um, again, another motivation is we have stakeholders and we want them to engage with our models? Do they think, are they comfortable with an individual level formulation? If so, if that recommends itself to them, you might want to use that. If we want to describe behaviors at multiple scales, when did we see this, folks? When did we see modeling at multiple levels, at least, within this class? When did we see a multi-level model? Who could tell me? We saw a multi-level model within this class. Okay, uh, okay, there are levels of a tree, but I'm not actually referring to that one. So that, that's sort of, because those are different points in time. But there's a multi-level model, model that modeled things at different levels of, of detail that we saw. What was it? We did it about three classes ago. Sorry, C city and population. Right. So we had a, we had a individuals, and then we had a city, and then we had the entire population. Remember, and and I argued that's a very general thing. You could generalize it so it's neighborhood individuals, neighborhoods, you know, um, regions of a city, city, province, country. Um, this is very easy to do with an individual model. More to the point, well, or, or equally importantly, I'd argue, is that it's a very natural structure because we have this nesting going on in a very natural way. Individuals are in some, the references to individuals are inside the city. The references sit to the city will be inside the province. And so it's a very natural depiction. Whereas in an aggregate model, you can total things up perhaps by breaking down stocks according to the city they represent. But the variables associated with the province would be sitting next to the variables associated with the city. There's no hierarchy within that model that mirrors that hierarchy in the world. So it's not as natural to ask certain types of questions or to apply certain types of statistics. Another final reason is if, we, if we're interested in the stochastics, we're interested in why we see such variability in real world data, for example, we want to capture that. It turns out that that's, if, we're, if we think it may be caused by individual level variability, that's an easy thing to do in an individual based model. Okay, for an aggregate based model, what, so any questions about this with individual based modeling? Any questions about these motivations? before I go on to discuss motivations for an aggregate model. Questions? The sound of silence. Okay. Um, so why would you build an aggregate model? We want to execute it quickly. It needs to execute quickly, for example, for user interactivity. So I know people who build climate models. And uh, models of climate vary hugely in their levels of richness. Most climate models these days run in quite sophisticated clusters of computers, supercomputers. You're simulating evolving cells of, of, of air columns above certain regions, etc. 
over a very, very large region. So it's, it's really massive amounts of computation that have to go into them. They're very sophisticated. But I know people, for example, uh, John Sturman, the author of, of uh, probably the, the best-selling textbook on system dynamics, um, he builds smaller models of, of climate that are calibrated to the large-scale models so that they give comparable results. But he uses these models, these smaller models, in sessions with people who are, who are learning about climate negotiations and learning about, about some of the, the longer-term consequences. And he does this to help communicate to them the consequences of reaching a, an effective um, uh, consensus or not of reaching a, a suitable agreement, what's the consequence of that agreement, etc. So they can run these things interactively during the sessions to get an understanding of the sorts of trade-offs they're talking about when they're talking about lowering emissions through this, you know, carbon market for this, or a, or a, um, a tax, on, uh, tax on carbon in this way, or carbon sequestration, etc. What will be the impact of investments or policies of this sort? Well, in that case, if you're looking for feedback to inform those negotiations as they are playing out, having a model that can execute quickly is advantageous. Another very important um, point that we haven't talked about here is by appropriate analysis of these models, we can gain insight into system behavior across all possible values for parameters. We can actually map out the response space for certain models in a comprehensive way that helps us understand what types of behaviors are possible for wide ranges of parameter values. Not just by running the model on a particular set of assumptions for parameters, but actually reasoning about what its behavior could be across a wide range of possible values of parameters. So here we mathematically analyze the model. We look at eigenvalues, perhaps around equilibria. We find the fixed points by setting the derivatives to zero, assuming the flows are zero, and solving for the values of the stocks, etc. And we can gain great insight into this. We can find that a certain policy, for example, greatly reduces the likelihood of an outbreak for a wide variety of illnesses. And that's very powerful to be able to generalize in that way. And aggregate models support that. An agent-based model, an individual-based model, you're not going to be able to get that measure of insight about how it might be in a wide variety of circumstances. We just don't have the sophisticated, as sophisticated a set of tools for analyzing stochastic models of that sort. We can do some sorts of analysis, but it's not nearly as rich as what we can do with these sort of deterministic aggregate models. If we want to use mathematical tools like control theory to identify high leverage parameters or identify policies that are in some sense optimal given our assumptions, we can in fact do that with an aggregate model. We can take an aggregate model described by differential equations and use the tools of control theory, optimal control, to, to help us uh, reason about, identify effective policies. That's not possible with an individual-based model given current state-of-the-art in terms of mathematical analysis. Um, if we want to extensively calibrate to a great deal of historic data, well, we might want to use an aggregate model um, rather than uh, trying to adjust many, many parameters within an, um, uh, within an individual-based model. If stakeholders have a desire to articulate things at a higher level, that will be one consideration. Um, if behavior for different subgroups differs only in degree, we could represent it with subscripting. Um, if there's no recourse to software engineering knowledge, if you don't have someone who's comfortable with Java, either yourself or others, um, Aggregate-based modeling is probably your preferred solution. There's large numbers of people building models in Vensim who are not computer programmers, who have never done computer programming. Just like there's tons of people using spreadsheets who have never done computer programming. But those same people, if you were to bring them to any logic, 
they're going to have a much steeper learning curve. Finally, if there's lack of detailed knowledge about individual level behavior or network structure, lack of individual level data, you may be spinning your wheels by speculating what's going on at an individual level, whereas you could start off and get much earlier traction with an aggregate level. There are times where individual behavior is sometimes much better known than that of collective behavior. So we have some under understanding, perhaps, of how people respond to incentives, or how a company responds to competition, or a young person responds to peer pressure, because studies may focus on this. And sometimes characterizing that at an individual level is actually easier than doing it at an aggregate level. At the same time, sometimes aggregate descriptions are, are simpler. For example, Sometimes we can actually define a mixing matrix um, that sort of nicely describes how people interact in the population rather than formulating enor in enormous detail network-based assumptions about how people are connected, particularly if we don't have the data to support that. We may find that it's, it's just easier to, to start off on an aggregate level. Okay, so... Um, Let's, let's talk a little bit about some of these considerations. One of them is the issue of formal approaches, formal analysis. Um, so we can use formal tools of, of uh, applied mathematics to help us explain observed behavior patterns, trace them back to what's driving them. I'm thinking here about, for example, using eigenvalue analysis um, to explain why oscillations originate. Uh, here we're, we're solving, um, solving the eigenvalue problem for, for differential equations. We're linearizing it around some equilibrium, typically. Uh, you may be interested in identifying behavior modes over a wide variety of possible scenarios, or identifying how behavior depends on parameters. So proving that within a certain range of parameter values, the infection will still die out, that it still will be robust. Um, even if your measurements uh, from, from survey data concerning people's mixing patterns are off or what have you. Um, you can also create what, what we call self-correcting models using control theory, tools like uh, the extended Kalman filter, more modern variants like uh, particle filter. Um, it's, it's more readily possible to create self-correcting models, models that that can be nudged back to accord with the data periodically. Um, whereas individual based models often have too many moving parts for this to be easily done. And finally, there's some formal calibration methods that make use of, of um, mathematical structure of models. Um, so, um, you know, here we may have a model that's described by differential equations. We take this model, we, we use some symbolic notation, we break it down into these equations. And these underlying uh, differential equations can be solved for fixed points. So can anyone tell me, when, when I talk about a fixed point, I talk in a, about a situation where the model's in balance. Things are not changing. It's in a sort of equilibrium state. What sort of fixed points would there be? What sort of equilibria would there be for an SIR model? Can anyone tell me? What, what sort of situations might there be where it's, it's currently in balance? balance. Nothing is, um, there, there's no sort of changes uh, in terms of the values, the number of people who are infected, susceptible, or recovered. Under what situations might that be true for an SIR model? Under what situations would changes not be occurring to the number of susceptible, infected, and recovered? Notice, by the way, I'm not saying no one's getting infected. It's just that you... As long as they're zero, right? The derivatives are all zero. Yes, exactly. So if the derivatives are zero then there's no change in the number of infectors. And a particular individual may get infected and may recover later, but there's someone else to take their place. 
So there may be immigration coming in, for example, into susceptible. Some people are getting infected at a low endemic rate and moving to infective status. Um, but some people are recovering and it's all in balance. And there's two situations where this can occur. One is an endemic equilibrium, typically, where the infection stays present. Incidentally, we can have this for computer viruses, too. It's a similar sort of phenomenon. An endemic equilibrium, things are in balance. We have the stock values not changing, so these derivatives are zero. So the left-hand side of each of these equations, the S dot, so D, in other words, ds dt, di dt, and dr dt, the rate of change of that, number of people by which i is going up per unit time, say, per day, it's zero. And we can solve, by setting those equal to zero, the left-hand sides, we can end up solving for S, for i, and for r. We can solve these sets of equations where the left sides are zero and identify the situations in terms of values of S, I, and R where it's in balance. And there'll typically be two situations. One, an endemic equilibrium where there's some amount of infection, but it's small enough. <coughs> it's sort of staying at a small level that Often it's small. Um, and we actually calculated what that level is, um, where, where it remains in endemic equilibrium. And I actually argued when we were going through the stock and flow dynamics associated with SIR that there's this endemic level, and the number of people I in the population approaches that endemic level. This, remind, uh, as, a, as a reminder, this only occurs if we have immigration coming in. If there's no immigration coming in, the number of infectives will be dropping arbitrarily, asymptotically to zero. Um, but if we do have people coming in, it's new fuel for the fire, and therefore the fire will be kept burning on an indefinite basis at this endemic level. So that's one equilibrium value. What's the other equilibrium value where there's no change to S, to I, and to R? It'll be a situation where under what other situation might it be sort of boring in the sense that there's not much going on? Well, if there's no infectives. There's no infectives. Is this going to be zero? Is I dot going to be zero if there's no infectives? Yes. This I and this term here is going to be zero? This i is going to be zero, so this is going to be zero. And, excuse me, if you have, um, okay, so yeah, I have to be careful here because here this, this will be rising as m comes in, as immigration comes in. If we had a closed population, it would be, it would be zero here, it would be zero here, it would be zero here. Um, and each of these would be zero as well. And so we can do, we can do some uh, analysis. This is from some work I've done in the past, but we can, we can linearize it around some fixed point. This is actually a depiction of sort of how the model would behave under different circumstances. Each of these sets of lines depicts sort of how it's going to move. So if you start off with this many susceptible people and this many infective people, it's going to sort of drag around and then it's going to come down. Whoa, this is what's called a phase plot. And it plots out over time sort of the number of infectives and numbers of susceptibles. And you can see it approaching this endemic equilibrium from the situation that where we had just a single infective. And we can linearize it around a given point, and we can actually derive eigenvalues and figure out sort of its behavior around that point, which often involves oscillations with certain frequency. Um, and we can, uh, very importantly, we can determine if this is stable or not. It turns out if the, if the eigenvalues are zero, are greater than zero, then it'll be unstable. What that means is that if you have an individual who comes in infective, a new individual, 
they can disturb the situation, there'll be a new outbreak. On the other hand, if an, if an equilibria is stable, it will resist that disturbance and no outbreak will occur. It won't lead to sudden divergent behavior. There'll be no positive feedback loop that's kicked up as a result. And instead, it will die down. So it's stable. Um, and we can explain basically dynamics of this sort uh, more readily with uh, an, aggregate, an aggregate model, sort of what's going on in terms of the feedback loops involved. So these feedbacks where we have susceptibles, infected, and recovered, um, we can sort of plot out, and we can actually, there's mathematical tools to do this, to take those set of equations, take those stocks and flows, and actually plot out which loops are dominant at any one port at any one point. <coughs> plot out sort of what's, what's driving the behavior at different points of this epidemic, for example, in terms of the stocks and flows. Okay, so formal analysis can be very helpful for understanding uh, behavior. We're going to be talking about some additional criteria here, however, as well. One of them is just uh, fidelity to dynamics. We've seen that an agent-based characterization can allow us to capture certain types of information in, in, um, in a richer way than an aggregate model readily would. This includes rich heterogeneity. We're going to come back to that learning and adaptation response to local incentives. Memory full processes. So when we introduced the first order delay, I noted that it was memoryless. Your chance of leaving per unit time from a stock is independent of how long you've been in that stock. Even if that chance of leaving is changing over time, it can't change based on how long you as an individual have, have been in that, in that stock. If we want to represent memory full processes, and aging is a memory full process, we go through, through, um, through life at a defined speed, um, and we could represent that quite exactly with an agent-based model. If we want to represent memory full processes in an, in an aggregate model, we can create aging chains of of memory less components that then become somewhat memory full, but they're, they're quite crude in their approximation. We can further represent um, uh, in terms of dynamics behavior over persistent networks or in space. Um, a very important point here is that the aggregate behavior is not necessarily the same as size of the population times the behavior of an average individual within the population. Sometimes you get behaviors that are dominated by a very small subset of individuals. For example, those in core groups. Those in, in certain sub-areas of the population where the tail wags the dog. A small element of the population that has deeply disproportionate impact on the remainder of the population. The 1% <coughs> that swings things. Um, so you know, when, we're, when we're characterizing these sort of, of phenomenon, we can often do better um, at an individual level. A particular example of concern here is what I've mentioned with history information. Um, for example, we may want to keep track of whether an individual is vaccinated, but not only that, but what type of vaccine they received. Was it adjuvanted? Was it a whole cell vaccine? Live, uh, was it a live vaccine? Um, were they exposed in utero? What was their birth weight? Uh, degree of glycemic control over the past decade is indicated by HbA1c levels for, sh for shorter periods of time. Exposure to adiposity, this is to, to, to fat um, cumulatively. Previous exposure to a pathogen. In some areas of health, we have access to longitudinal data that provides information on individual historical trajectories. Here in Saskatchewan, we're particularly lucky because we have this hemisphere's richest set of um, administrative data that is longitudinal in character and that we, that we can work with. And if we want to match that longitudinal data, that data on an individual over time that follows an individual as they progress through their life course, if we want to match that up, we can really only exploit the real value of that information with an individual-based model. 
with an aggregate model, um, we can capture a limited amount of historic information by disaggregating the stock. For example, having a different category for people who have been vaccinated or not. Having different categorization for people who are exposed in urine or to diabetes or, or not. But characterizing people by some continuous attributes, such as their birth weight, is almost always infeasible. We can classify them by broad characterizations of their, uh, of their birth weight, but it blows up the entire model. We basically have to multiply the size of the population by the number of distinctions we want to make. So if we want to break it down by 10 categories, the size of the model goes up by a factor of 10. And often it becomes cumbersome as well. Um, and uh, here it's, it's very complex to provide distribution of trajectories of how long it takes for example, from someone to reach from here to here, the number of individuals with this background that, that went this way versus that way. In an individual-based model, we can readily capture discrete and continuous history information very easily. We can just save it away at an individual-based level. Remember, folks, this important distinction. An aggregate model breaks the population out, organizes the population by state. And for each of those state categories, what it keeps track of is the number of individuals of that state, right? That's the data that it keeps track of for each of those breakdowns of organization. And an individual-based model organizes the population not by state, but by individual. And for each of those individuals, it records data having to do with the characteristics of that individual. So. If we want to store away some extra information about their birth weight or about their history of exposure to adiposity, to fat, or their history of exposure to, to uh, dysglycemia in utero, we can do so with a continuous variable at the individual level. It's not, it doesn't really add substantively to the, um, to the weight uh, of the model. So here we can keep track of continuous variables or discrete variables very readily. We can have agent dynamics according to stocks and flows. It's worth reflecting on the fact that in an aggregate model, the breakdowns of the population are, uh, are discrete in character. So S, I, R. At an individual level, we could keep track of I, for example, the progression of infection in a continuous fashion. An individual's level of virions, of virus particles, could rise over time in a continuous way and decline according to differential equations. And we'll see some of those sorts of models next time. At an individual level, we have that flexibility. At an aggregate level, we are we are straightjacketed into breaking down the population according to discrete categories. Not always dichotomous, not always by a factor of two, yes or no, although it's often that, but, but into sort of discrete categories. So if we want to break it down by birth weight, we can do it into a set of discrete categories. If we want to break it down by infection status, we can do it in a set of discrete progressions of infection. At an individual base level, we have that flexibility to specify it continuously. In terms of longitudinal flexibility, the key observation here is an aggregate model provides a series of cross-sectional depictions of system state. So we're describing over time the breakdown of the, of the population according to which stock they're in. So if I were to go back and look at this sort of population, we're characterizing the number of people who are susceptible, number infected, number recovered, but we're not keeping track of those individuals. Again, we're not saying, okay, this individual came into infection now and left it at this later time. You know, this individual is here at time zero and here at time 10 and is here at time 20. We don't really know that. We're abstracting away from all of that. It could be that it's you know, some individuals dwelling for a long time here, some going through quickly. 
It could be that people go through at a very stately, regular pace. It could be that it's just a very small subset of the population remaining here for a long time, um, rather than, and, and well, okay, it wouldn't be in this case because we have the recovered situation, but if we had sort of an SIS model where they flow back, we can't distinguish whether it's a small subset of the, of the population getting infected many, many times, or a the broader population each getting infected one time on average. We can't really distinguish that. This gives a cross-sectional depiction, not a longitudinal one. We're breaking it down by number of individuals in different categories over time, not, not following particular individuals. Um, now, th this, is, this is a real issue because we often don't know. So our system dynamics models do assume, our stock and flow models do assume, our aggregate models do assume something about individual trajectories. It's just we don't have access to that, to those assumptions typically. We've built some algorithms that help us understand what those implications are, but they're hidden from us. And so when we build these models, we're making assumptions about these things, but we can't often articulate what those assumptions are. By contrast, an individual-based model provides both cross-sectional depictions and longitudinal depictions. We can follow individuals. The system state at a particular moment is cross-sectional. We could sum up the number of people who are S, I, and R across our entire population. That very first model we worked with, uh, having the spread of infection within some space over time where people were yellow if susceptible and red if infected and gray if, if recovered, here, we could sum up at a particular moment in time the number of people infected, recovered, and susceptible. In fact, that model did it up at the top. It had a little summary of that. But we can also follow an individual and ask how long is it, what is the time generally taken for the time of infection to time of recovery? How many people get infected more than once? What's the histogram of the number of times they've been infected? We can't ask that question directly with existing tools for an aggregate model, even though there is some hidden assumption about it. In calibration and validation, because we have access in an individual level model to both longitudinal and cross-sectional descriptions, we can match those up against historic data, against empirical data, in a way we can't do with a, a cross-sectional model. So in an aggregate model, um, we have uh, difficulties trying to compare the results of the aggregate model with, um, with uh, certain types of historic data. So if we do, for example, have data on women, and, and we can ask uh, how many women who have had gestational diabetes have had two or more bouts of it, we, we have a difficult time seeing if our aggregate model accords with that. Whereas that's a, a thing we can readily do with an individual-based uh, model. Right. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, longitudinal data can really distinguish between situations that are very, very different. Again, situations where a large fraction of the population is getting infected with STIs over time versus a very small you know, uh, just a few times, um, you know, one or one or one or two times each, versus a situation where a small subgroup of the population, the frequent flyers, are getting infected very frequently. Our models make assumptions about this, but with an aggregate model, we can't easily articulate that. Another example would be smoking. So imagine uh, trying to distinguish a situation where one set of people quit and stay quit as former smokers. Um, while well, another set remain as current smokers versus a situation where the entire set cycle through situations where quit, relapse, and repeat. Cross-sectionally, we can't distinguish these things. Longitudinally, because the counts may be the same, longitudinally, we can, we can say, oh, okay, there's two very different classes of people with respect to their trajectories, with respect to their histories, their biographies. And these situations have very different health consequences. 
the fact that we can't distinguish these readily in a cross-sectional model, in an aggregate model, is disconcerting. Particularly when we're trying to use that model to evaluate the consequences of interventions. Um, and similar examples are easy to imagine for, for other cases. Okay. Um, and the interesting thing is we probably choose very different interventions for each of these two cases. If it was a broad set of people who just quit, relapse, and, and go through the cycle versus a situation of sort of diehard smokers versus those who, who, uh, who are persistent quitters, we might, we might address these groups very differently in situation one or situation two we, we would uh, have a formulation that's broader based. Um, so, so let's talk about trajectories. If you have significant longitudinal information, you'd strongly like the model to match. If you have good reason to think the tra trajectory history of an individual is important consequences to health, or if you seek to examine the effects of policies that make use of information on individual history, for example, that treat people with STIs differently based on how many times they previously come to the clinic. If so, an individual level model might be really more desirable because it will allow you to deal with these situations in different ways, for example, or make use of trajectory uh, information on individuals. Um, and again, disaggregating stocks, you can capture limited amounts of information, but to really capture history information well, you really, you really need to go to the individual level, particularly continuous um, breakdowns. Um, Let's talk just a little bit about heterogeneity more generally. Um, heterogeneity, um, differences between individuals within a population often very significantly impacts policy effectiveness. Policies can preferentially affect certain subgroups. Um, they can offer, uh, sometimes alter the balance of heterogeneity in the population, um, can change population statistics, and and it can be problematic to assume that the average person in the population is representative of the population as a whole. And, and it can be problematic to examine policy effects against the average person. So assessing policy effectiveness often requires representing heterogeneity and flexibility in representing that is hard to achieve um, in an aggregate model. Um, so there's a variety of studies that have looked at... Um, at a sort of impacts of heterogeneity and found really uh, large effects. Um, an important consideration here is failing to disaggregate, to represent heterogeneity, can impose implicit value judgment. So we may be a tre uh, treating a situation as net zero cost if it's favoring group A while disadvantaging group B. If we're not breaking those out, we don't know if it's favoring one group, disfavoring another, we'll treat it as if, as if it's had net zero change which can be really problematic. So there can be value judgments associated with sort of hiding these details. We've talked in this class about some of the ways heterogeneity can be pronounced and why individuals who are way out here, small numbers of individuals who have large numbers of connections can disproportionately affect things. Why is that? Someone in, someone in this class should be able to articulate that after we've gone over it before. Um, why is it that people say with large numbers of, of partners actually are particularly large concern from a public health perspective. Why do they have a disproportionate impact on health outcomes more broadly? The health burden of STIs within the population. Why is it that people with large number of partners are so important? There's two reasons. Why is that? Yes. So if infected, they're likely to disperse it to a large number of people. And further, they are what? So if they're infected, they're more likely to disperse it to large numbers of people. And what's the other reason? How likely are they to be infected compared to other people? Quite likely, because they can collect it from a wide variety of people. So they're simultaneously more likely to get infected and more likely to disseminate it widely if they do get infected. And that's the double whammy. That, that really causes problems and that leads to the tail wagging the dog. Okay, so and, and this has led to an attention um, on core groups. Um, 
individuals who are, are tightly connected and, for example, may have a large number of partners, um, large amounts of contacts with others. Um, and um, often, often we'll see uh, quite high infection rates um, across multiple infections within these individuals because they're in such levels of contact. They may get chlamydia, but they may also get gonorrhea. They may also uh, be subject to, uh, to other infections like HPV, which cause big problems uh, in terms of, of uh, uh, cervical cancer risks. Um, so, you know, here we may see very different infection rates within these populations, and focusing interventions on them can give great bang for the buck. You can achieve a great deal with a modest amount of, of, of effort. So because of all these considerations, we often seek to represent and reason about interventions targeting these individuals. But to represent them requires representing heterogeneity in the population. It means we don't just put all individuals into that I category. And, and even breaking down by sexual activity level um, may not capture the variety of types of interventions we want to focus on. If we want to look at peer network effects, we may want to capture um, social transmission uh, networks, and we may want to capture sexual transmission networks. So this is an example of, of some networks from Saskatchewan um, clustering within our TV network, which represents partly social grouplings and, and partly uh, geographic groupings as well. These individuals between these clusters may be uh, of particular key relevance because they may be the conduit of infection from one area to the other. Trying to capture that within an aggregate model is troubling to do. It's, it's, it's really, really challenging. Um, so, uh, you know, here, if, particularly if you want to represent progression along many dimensions of heterogeneity, it's quite, quite tricky. Um, the challenge for an aggregate model, and I'm going to be finishing up in just a minute here, is there's really two ways to try to represent heterogeneity in aggregate models. One is called a co-flow. We haven't, we haven't talked about it, but basically it's representing um, sort of an average, uh, average case situation. It's quite clever type of strategy. Um, and we can capture sort of mean statistics in, in a clever way. But the, the most common way to capture heterogeneity here is through and, and certainly the one that's required for certain types of analyses, co-flows are very limited in what they can give you, are attribute-based disaggregation. So here we divide the population up into categories that are, are different with respect to our heterogeneity uh, dimension of interest. So we divide it up into our population of SIR model. We have two copies of each stock, one for males, one for females. And then maybe we have for each of 17 age categories. So that goes from three original stocks to six, to break it down by sex, to six times 17, if we want to break it down by age as well, so 104 stocks. This can be, it's going to be quite awkward, and it, it exhibits poor scaling, geometric scaling. As we raise the number of dimensions of heterogeneity, the number of, of stocks that we need to keep track of rises rapidly. So here, for example, is a Venson model using subscripting, where we can use this convenient technique to, to sort of specify things um, along several of these dimensions so we don't have 104 categories in front of us, so we don't have, have uh, 104 divided by three categories. We want to distinguish S, I, and R. Instead, we can have an S and I and R. The S is then further broken down by age and ethnicity, for example, or age and sex. Um, we can do this in Venson, but it becomes quite complex um, to do this well. And capturing progression along two dimensions, say smoking status on the one hand and progression of TB, is very, very difficult. Whereas in an individual-based model, we can have simply parallel state charts. And they're more or less independent. They can interact in, in focused ways. For example, the fact that you're in a certain diabetes state may make your chance of developing TB, active TB, worse because of weakened immune system. Or the fact that you're using tobacco may worsen your chance of, of getting infected with TB in the first place. 
but those, those interactions are very localized. By contrast, ladies and gentlemen, here in an aggregate model, we have to consider all possible combinations of states, which becomes combinatorially very messy. Similarly, we can kind of, in an individual level, quite nicely sort of decompose. Um, so if we want to consider heterogeneity at an individual level model, we can keep track of things much more richly, even at a continuous level, very readily in an individual-based model. Um, in an aggregate model, we have to add subscripts or, dis or co make copies of stocks in a way that, um, that, is not, um, that scales very unfavorably and further that um, becomes very, very cumbersome. Um, it also is very inflexible if you want to investigate the impact of adding a new heterogeneity dimension. It causes blow up across the entire model. So I think I'm going to leave it um, at that for today. Uh, I may make some further comments on this next time, but we're going to be uh, needing to go on fairly quickly to the issue of hybrid models and looking at some very particular models which blur the boundary for whether it's a stock and flow model or whether it's a, an agent-based model, whether it's a discrete event model or an agent-based model. We'll be looking at those combinations. Um, we may do that for most of our time next time, um, or we may finish this up and, and then go on. I'll have to look how much is, is left.